to the Pastor Chara Show. I'm Pastor Chara, and today we launch. We launch into new mindset. We launch into new territory. We launch into new relationships. Come on and launch out with me today. It's time to go. So today I'm excited. I'm really, really excited because we have someone that is joining us from an organization called Hope Work. And this is someone that I have known, I, I have, like a lot of these people I know. Um, and this is somebody that, who has been a trendsetter since I met her years ago. She's always been a trendsetter. Um, she's always been her own person. She has always been one that you want to watch. And we have watched one another over the years. And I've watched her get to this place. Right? And so now we're going to sit down and we're going to have this conversation because she is the director of this awesome organization. And I'm going to bring her in. Come on, Aaliyah. Let's just start this conversation. How are you? Hi. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so thank excited. <laughs> Listen, I can't do anything but warm. Because that's who you are. You've always been warm. You've always been inviting. You've always had a smile on your face. You've always been engaging. Like, that is just the person that you are. So, I am not surprised that you were doing the work that you're doing and how you're doing it and as long as you've been doing it. But I'm not going to talk about that. How about you introduce yourself? You tell the people about yourself. <laughs> well, first, I want to say thank you, Pastor inviting me today and come speak the truth and talk about the work that I'm doing at Hope Works, um, which is a nonprofit social employment enterprise in Camden, New Jersey. We service young people between the ages of 17 and 26, providing them with tech training, work-based learning experiences, and then uh, sending them out to competitive employment with one of our employer partners. And so that's it kind of in a nutshell. But I've been doing this type of work. And when I say this type of work, I'm talking about like youth development work, community work, being an economic and social justice agent for at least the last 30 years. So that's why my gray is covered. <laughs> <laughs> listen, we cover it all. Like we do what we got to do. <laughs> but listen, that gray says that you've been through some stuff, that you've done some things, that you've accomplished some things. So don't hide it. Show it, girl. It's gorgeous. I know it is. <laughs> but I'm 30 years. So this has been a journey for you, um, working with youth and doing the things that you've been doing. But it started not just as a career, but it started, because you said 30, it started really in your high school years, right? And the things that you've been oh, doing. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And even just a little bit before high school, my um, one of my first mentors, uh, Jermon Lewis, she was the director of youth programming at the YWCA on Germantown Avenue. And yeah. when she got that job, I was about 12 years old at that time. Wow. Uh, I was one of her dancers. I, I took dance class with her, but she's always been an advocate uh, in the community. And when I turned 14, uh, she gave me my first job uh, working as a camp counselor. Wow. Indeed. And so she was also involved in a lot of the social organizing and community organizing that was going on here in Philadelphia at that time, which would have put that at about the late 80s. So there was a lot going on at that time. And she would yes. take me to rallies and she would take me to lectures, um, Kwanzaa events and just becoming not only uh, socially and politically active, but also being culturally active uh, mm -hmm. as well, which was which came naturally for me because I was born into a culturally astute family. So, right. you know, it, it just kind of, it, it fit. Uh, but she was my number one champion and cheerleader uh, to move me forward. And I, when I, and I looked at her and I said, I want to do this work um, when I become an adult. I don't know what that looks like or what do you major in when you go to college to do this, to do this work. Right. This is the work that I want to do. Uh, and she took a posting with her husband in Germany and left kind of left me the baton and said, Aaliyah, wow. take this baton and run with it. And so I had her charge and then that was kind of, it was all she wrote after that. And then wow. of course, you know, when I got to high school, met Evelyn Scott, 
and then that was the second chapter of that when we met in high yes. school um, and Evelyn Scott also very culturally astute mm-hmm. and you know and moved me forward and it just became my it became my path so this isn't just a career this isn't just um, a job this is passion and this is passion this is longevity passion but it's also legacy passion is what I heard because you're not just doing this because I love this but you're doing this because you know what I got to make sure what was put in me continues and then continues like if this doesn't stop what do you that's amazing in itself because I don't think that a lot of us think about or and even I mean you're talking about from 12 to <clears throat> the age we are now um, <laughs> but we don't we don't talk about and we don't think about those things and we don't necessarily always teach those things and we'll talk about that when we talk about hope works but we don't necessarily teach those things in our homes anymore which is transpiring into a lot of some of the stuff that we see going on in our neighborhoods and in our streets talk to that yeah i mean what you have me thinking about is i spent 19 years working for the philadelphia department of parks and recreation and 15 of those years working inside of recreation centers and thinking about what was my role as as a recreation leader and what it wasn't was to come in and tell a community how to behave but what i would say is that recreation centers are create cultural norms in communities yes. whatever's being allowed to happen at the recreation center it kind of like spills over into the daily lives of the community so whatever's happening there is happening in the community and what I saw was an opportunity to to train young people uh, mm-hmm. in doing this work, how to become leaders and agents in their community. And I think a lot of times we were miss, we were having conversations, but we weren't inviting young people to the table, mm-hmm. which is what my mentors did for me. They allowed me to have a seat at the table. Um, right. Jermon Lewis, who I was talking about earlier, she created a youth development leadership program at the Y, and I was a part of that program. So we always had a voice mm-hmm. in terms of when we are making decisions about young people, they should be at the table, which is why mm-hmm. sometimes our programs don't work because they don't have youth voice. And youth voice is important. We can't create anything for someone else without ha- let, allowing them to have a seat at the table and we're always it that is amazing because we're always trying to create stuff to fix things to fix communities and did you talk to the people did, did you find out what they want did, did you find out what they need how can exactly. you find out what they need right but we're always coming in trying to fix it because we can make it better for them or they need this or that and you're so right. There's so often, so many times when, you know, we say what the youth need. We say what our young people need. We say what they need to do or how they need to be. But are we talking to them and finding out what they're really dealing with and what they're really mm-hmm. dealing with walking in the streets, what they're dealing with at home, how these things are affecting them? how the you know just school and you know the things that you're dealing with how is affecting them yeah i mean i was i was able to get a bird's eye view to Mm -hmm. what was happening because you know the recreation centers are open from 2 p.m to 10 p.m and i didn't was i was sitting at home watching the morning talk shows until 1 30 until it was time to leave for work And this one particular summer, a young man came in and he said, I am the TSS worker for this young person. And I said, TSS worker? And he said, well, I shadow young people who have behavioral health um, issues in the school and I help them uh, learn new behaviors and adapt. And he said, Miss Ali, I think you would be good at this. So I did a little investigating and realized I could do this between 8.30 in the morning and 1.30. Mm Mm-hmm. And then if I was good enough, I could ask the staffing agency to place me at the school that was across the street or around the corner from the recreation center that I was assigned to. Mm -hmm. So I could really dig deep into the community. And so I was able to get a bird's eye view 
into the lives of young people before they came to the recreation center, what they were experiencing in the schools and a behavior and mental health capacity. And I end up doing that together in tandem, those two jobs um, for 15 years, working inside of the schools, providing mental health services to young people and then working with them in the community in the afternoon. And what I saw in the schools was horrific. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was like, I need to have a bigger voice. And I know a lot of times we believe, you know, boots in the ground. I have to be boots on the ground. But what I realized in terms of professional development, that I needed to get a seat at the big table, the table that was creating policy, the table that was making decisions yes. for programming and how yes. to create programming. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what led me down the path to getting a master's degree so that I could learn, then begin to work my way towards having a seat at the table and moving up in positions so that I could have a larger voice and and represent the young people that I saw weren't being adequately represented at the table. But you said something key, because you said, I need a seat at the big table, at the big people's table, not the yeah. children's table, right, that we set up for Thanksgiving. But I need to go to the big people's table and hear that conversation. I need to go to the big people's table and be in those conversations so that we can do what needs to be done for the people at the little table that are at the table, but it's not the right table in order to get things done. And we have to really, that is so key because we always talk about our languages. We need to be in the rooms. We need to be at the table, but what room and what table are you talking about? Because is it the room and, and the table that'll make impact? And making sure that your voice is not silenced in that if I talk to my young people all the time and I say, you know, the, the generation now, they have the Me Too movement, they have uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. But when I was coming up in terms of my professional development, things were a lot different. Yes. And you were usually a lot of times you were the only in the room, you know, sometimes being the only person of color in the room. A lot of times in recreation, uh, which is a male dominated profession, yeah. being, you know, the only the female. female in the room. Yeah. And what that meant. And for me, what it meant was having my professional development arrested because I was vocal, because mm -hmm. I felt like I had earned a seat at the table. And sometimes when you go against the status quo and you are trying to be a voice of change, um, sometimes it is not received well. Mm -hmm. But I was mm -hmm. okay. With, I was okay with that. Right, um, right. Because I knew in order for change to happen, you had to begin to challenge people's uh, perceptions and beliefs, particularly about young people, particularly about African-American uh, mm -hmm. young people, because there's a lot of stigma and a lot of stereotypes and you want to be able to sit down at the table and break that down. Although I used to always have to say, we're not a homogenous group and I can't sit here and speak for all African-Americans, but I right. do have a perspective that needs to be heard. Right. And that's key because you also said that there are differences like there are the differences in when we grow up, right? And how times are and the things that we're dealing with even now and the things that the young people are dealing with now. And it's, it's so important to see those points. On the other side of this break, we are going to dig into hope work and what we do, what you do. Look, I didn't put myself in it. What you do <laughs> at Hope Work and how it is impacting our young people today. We're going to go to a commercial break and we will be right back right after this break. You can join us virtually or at the church located at 458 East Rittenhouse Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We're back. And so we are talking to Aaliyah Sutton Bay. She is the director of Hope Work. 
over in Camden, New Jersey. But we are talking her to her today about her journey. And now we're going to start talking about the journey of hope work. So, Leah, <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, so we were talking about, you know, getting in the rooms, getting at the table, getting at the big table. So now that you have done those things and you went to school and you got your degrees and it's so bad that we can't it's true we can't get in the rooms and we can't get at the tables unless we got a piece of paper because that makes us yeah we call it we call it the inflation but we also know that it's a part of the structural system to keep certain voices from having a seat at, at the table mm -hmm. um and so I knew what I needed to do at that time. And so I was willing to do it. I mean, but you know, African-American women, we are some of the most educated uh, folks right now uh, in this country uh, because we knew what we needed to do to get a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 it's, it's interesting. You should say that because the work that I do now at Hope Works, we are actually debunking that. We are leapfrogging the, what I call student loan education track Yes. that is set for a lot of our young people by training them uh, and giving them technical skills mm -hmm. where we know that they can get uh, entry-level and mid-level tech jobs and earn uh, a living wage to eventually break the cycle of generational poverty. What are some of the tech skills that they get when they come to HopeWorks? Sure. When they come into the training, um, our advanced training um, will allow them to do front-end web development, mm. geographic information systems, mm. and then we have some mid-skill programs where they can learn Linux and um, search engine optimization. So these are real tech jobs in real tech companies paying yes. real living wage jobs. Wow, so you actually have partnerships with schools and with companies in order to train them in order to get these skills, in order to go into the workforce and really be able to create a living wage for themselves. Yeah, we have relationships across the board with all of the uh, players that would be involved in workforce uh, schools, workforce boards. Our executive director, Dan Roten, is on the phone and working tirelessly, tirelessly every day um, to get employers because none of this works if there are not employers on the other side. Our commitment to our young people when they come into the program is that there is a living wage job on the other end of the of the training. Uh, a lot of training programs, they train and they pray that the, the people that they train will get employment, but it is our commitment that there is employment on the other side of the training. So how did HopeWorks get started because i want to say i'm just going to be honest with everything that you did i mean leading up to this point i want to say that you started hope works <laughs> like this is your baby you started it this is all you so tell me how <laughs> tell me how hope works got started i wish i could say it but it, i found a home that was the right fit for me and that's okay. that's what happened but Hopeworks has been around for 20 years, um, a little over 20 years, actually. And it was started by three Jesuit priests who belonged to some churches in Camden who got together and said, we have to address some of the issues that's going on with young people in Camden. And one of them said, you know what? Computers is a thing. Let's get some computers and bring them into one of the houses that the churches own. And let's start an after school program and oh let's start a check training program. And that's kind of how Hopeworks got started. And, you know, it was ministry for those priests, right? And I, you know, here we are 20 years later, we are in a downtown space in downtown Camden. Our offices look just like any tech company that you could walk in, work, uh, walk into. The space is designed intentionally to create a microcosm of tech space for our young people. So there's not that huge transition of going, say, from a school setting into a work setting mm -hmm. from day one. We are working with our young people in preparation for work. Hope works. Okay. Click. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So how do, so that's an interesting point right there because they, they saw a need, they saw a need and they opened it up, but how did they draw the young people in? Like how did they get them 
into the program and how do you get these young people into the programs? Great question. Uh, people ask all the time about uh, like how, we, how do we recruit? And our biggest recruitment is word of mouth. Okay. Uh, I don't have to go out and put a lot of flyers up. I don't have to go out and do a lot of public speaking. Uh, young people come into the program. They have a great experience. And then the next thing you know, they're coming over to my desk and saying, Ms. Ali, I'm telling my friend and this friend and this friend. And then it just kind of spirals. And that's how we get a lot of our referrals. But I would also like to point out that uh, the reason why young people want to refer their friends is because the way we approach our work. Mm -hmm. So we are a sanctuary, certified sanctuary workplace. Uh, we use trauma-informed practices because not only do I have to give them the skill, I also have to create a space for healing. Yes. You know, we, we live in a times where, where many of us, are, you know, experience trauma. And we, we carry that trauma with us and we bring it into the workplace as well. So we have to create a space of healing. And so when I talk about, you know, trauma informed practices, I talk about approaching my work with kindness and care. And so young people come into the space knowing that they are going to be treated with dignity, with respect, and we are going to work with them. I do not throw young people out of the program because they don't show up or all of those things you see in traditional programs. Right. We don't do that. We don't do things to young people at Hope Works. We work with young people to help them transform their lives and to heal so that they can be productive employees in the workplace and be productive people in society. And right. so I think that that is so important that you are talking about, no, we have to recognize and we have to realize and we have to see and we have to seed into these young people to let them know, no, you don't have to stay in this place. No, you don't have to stay like this. Yes, there is better for you. Yes, you can do more. No, you don't have to be on the corner. Yes, you can make a good living income and you can be a productive person person within society yes you can you do i sound like obama but yes you can <laughs> but i mean but absolutely and that that cheerleader spirit is the spirit of everybody that is employed at hope works mm. like it's not when you come to hope works you're only going to get kindness and care from miss alia you're going to get kindness and care from our executive director all the way down uh, we screen and extensively um in terms of how we hire young people are a part of our hiring process and if you get that veto from the young people the job cannot be yours because these the young people are the people that you are servicing that's who you are in service to while you're going through this commitment and it's and, and i'm glad that you said yes you can and that's the belief we approach our work what listen every day i am amazed and more amazed by the work that is produced by our young people. They are entrepreneurs, they are mm. creatives, they are extremely talented. And until we as a society begin to look at young people from a strength-based framework, instead of a deficit framework, mm -hmm. it's hard to move the needle because our programs are then entrenched in that deficit model. We've got to move to a strength-based model and meet young people where they are that's why we don't have a cohort model we have rolling admissions we don't have deadlines you have to finish the program in a certain amount of time it takes some people six to eight weeks to finish the training program it could take six months to eight months for someone to finish the training program but we meet them where we they are and we do barrier reduction services we partner with other organizations in camden and in philadelphia to ensure young people have all the things that they need from mental and behavioral health services to hooking up with food pantries to making sure that we have um, shelters in place when young people become homeless because housing instability is a yeah. huge issue for many of our young people. And you'll find that, you know, there's just not enough housing uh, for young people. And there's a lot of bureau uh, bureaucratic red tape and trying to find housing yes. for someone, particularly yes. if they are an unaccompanied minor. Mm -hmm. um, so we do all of that and we don't try to do everything. We partner with other youth servicing, um, human services organizations in Camden and Philadelphia to make sure that those that are doing the work and doing it well, we partner with them so that we can focus on what we do well, which is employment and workforce. So where, you just keep saying Philadelphia, where's the Philadelphia campus at then? Because <laughs> you keep talking about that. <laughs> l l listen, you, you know my heart is here. You know my heart is in Philadelphia. <laughs> born, born and raised. Yes. Um, 
but we take we do receive young people uh coming in from philadelphia because we jump on the paco at 8th and market or at 15th and locust we are two stops on the paco line you get right off in camden come up the steps walk down the street and you are at hope works um okay. and if they're worried about transportation support i offer that too do you need a bus pass wow. come see me and i will give you a bus pass to ensure that you can get there when we talk about programs having barriers to entry whole works is what we call a low barrier entry program mm -hmm. you just need to be between the ages of 17 and 26 you do not have to have a high school diploma because i have an adult basic skills program we will help you get your high school diploma wow. um i do not accept any in school youth because i'm not encouraging young people to drop out of school to come to whole works stay in school <laughs> and when you graduate Come see me. We will be there waiting for you with open arms. Um, you don't, you have to be an out-of-school youth. And lately, we've been asking, are you a Pennsylvania or New Jersey, Philadelphia, Camden County resident? Because I've been getting phone calls lately from across the country of young people saying, wow. Miss Aaliyah, I heard about your program. You have to bring your program to Memphis. I got a call from North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. Miss Aaliyah, you have to bring your program to North Carolina. So my, my dream is that one day we will be able to expand and scale our services. But for right now, we are very local. So how can how can we how can we get the services within the ministries as this started as a ministry right as it started as a ministry to service the young people how can the ministries the churches and the ministries within the areas how can we get this program within our churches so that the expansion can happen because that's what i see i see this expanding and going and how do we do that well for, for starters now it's just you know get, joining with us right joining mm -hmm. with us in this cause because we are we open our doors and we're willing to partner with anybody if you are anti-violence if you are anti-poverty then we want to partner with you and i think that we're going to be able to spread this ministry as we begin to build our partners yeah come aboard this train because the train is moving and you know yes. the more the better the more the merrier Listen, I'm excited. We are so out of time, but I am so excited that we have had this communication, this conversation. We are going to post your information so that people can be in touch with you. I'm going to be in touch with you. I so thank you for joining me on the Pastor Tyra Show and having this conversation. You're amazing. I love you. I appreciate you. And I thank each and every watcher for joining us for this conversation about hope works because hope works.